Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Podium Picks. I'm Sean Woodland inside the Working Against Gravity Studios. Tommy Marquez is joining us uh, from a remote location somewhere in beautiful Santa Cruz, California. <laughs> Tommy, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing all right. I like how you, you try to subtly didn't not give away my location while giving away my location is just, fantastic. Yes, just the general vicinity. So yeah, you are you are in lovely Santa Cruz, uh, California uh, for today's episode. We're going to be taking a look at our favorite pieces of games equipment. So yes. quite a few things to choose from there. Yeah, a lot, lot of good options there. I, I wish I wish I could do this one in person. But uh, I'm I'm an idiot and left my keys <laughs> in my fiance's car. And she drove to work this morning, which is 45 minutes away. And now I am, I'm stuck to my house. I'm like, yes. a I'm like a child just <laughs> relegated to the, to the confines of my apartment. <laughs> There's milk in the fridge. If you have any problems, talk to the neighbors. <laughs> yeah. um, but before we start, uh, we want to once again, thank our presenting sponsors for today's show, Working Against Gravity. And they are really helping people out when it comes to, you know, dialing in their nutrition and helping them create habits that become part of their routine and not something that they just, you know, sort of hop on and off of. And I think that's key, Sean, because we want to build sustainable nutrition habits that are going to stick with us for the long term, right? Because just like fitness for us is a long term goal, it's a lifelong goal. Healthy nutrition and quality eating is a long term goal for anyone that has been a part of Team WAG as well. A great example of that is uh, I just got back from Indiana on the road. And one of the, the things that I've worked out with my nutritionist and my one on one coach is that when I'm on the road, I, I like to um, intermittent fast for the morning part to help control the fact that usually when I'm on the road, I'm out eating out a little bit more. I'm kind of at the mercy of the event. And usually I'm eating more calorie dense foods along with maybe a few um, beverages of the 21 and older variety. Um, and so to help combat that, we've set up some practices for both on the road and off the road to kind of help me dial in my nutrition and best support my lifestyle. And they can do that for you too. They'll pair you one-on-one -on -one with your very own coach. You'll do weekly check-ins along with 24 seven round the clock messaging and 24 hour response times on your check-ins. And they have a great software called Seismic that keeps all of your data for you to access. So you can see your progress over time and the different evolutions to help you learn as well. And if you guys are interested, they'll give you 50 bucks off your first month. If you go to workingagainstgravity.com Type in the code ELITE50, get signed up for their wait list, uh, and trust me, you guys will not regret it. Yeah, we love having Working Against Gravity on board. We also uh, want to thank our sponsor, Whoop, and something that we started doing with our Podium Pick segment with Whoop is uh, we have a pretty sizable Whoop group now for Talking Elite Fitness, and we like to kind of run down the, the top people in every <coughs> category uh, from our Whoop group. And so today, we are going to be looking at our top recovery scores for the entire month now of August as we are basically staring September right in the face. Yes, hard to believe that it's already <laughs> September, but since we are at the exact end of September, uh, the exact end of August, we have a perfect amount of data set to calculate our top 10 recovery score athletes for the entire month. So here are our top athletes for the month on the Talking Elite Fitness Whoop Group. Number one, Derek Keegan with a monthly average of 92%. Woo! Man. Cong congrats, Derek. Number two, Jeremy Lundstrom, 90%. Number three, Maggie Robertson, 89%. Number four, Annie Barthel, 88%. Number five, Sarah McGarry, 85%. Number six, Eric Mounier, 85%. Number seven, Richie Carey, 84%. Number eight, Na Natalia Oatsfall, 82%. Number nine, Luke Kelly, 81%. And 10, Rounding out the top 10 for the month of August on our Talking Elite Fitness group is Jimmy. Uh, okay, all right. I'm going to butcher this. Uh, Kai Kendall. Kai Kendall. All right. Yep, I think I got it. Jimmy Kai Kendall, 81%. And all of those are well in the green, well above what we've been putting up. So if you heard us call your name at any point in time and you're in the top 10, share us your recovery tips. Let us know what you guys are doing to maximize your recovery uh, and your score on WHOOP. Um, and maybe share a little bit of the love with your fellow Talking Elite Fitness Whoop groupers. Yes, I need as many good tips for recovery as I can get. I have been uh, yellow and red for quite a, quite a long period of time. I think my last <laughs> green was about a week and a half ago. But 
Uh, we're going to try to get on top of that and fix that. And hey, if you want to get on uh, on the Whoop train, head to whoop.com, enter the code uh, TALKING15, and you'll get 15% off and you will start optimizing the way that you train. It's a great tool. Can't recommend it enough. All right, let's get on to now the our picks, our podium picks for this week. And we're back in the CrossFit realm. And we, uh, we just started talking about, you know, cool pieces of equipment that have shown up at the CrossFit Games, and there have been a lot. Uh, but which ones are the best? So we're going to run down our spirit of the games, our dark horses, and then our top three as well. Uh, and once again, since I can't remember anything past a week, I don't remember who started last week. I think it may have been you. Yeah, I think I did. All right. So I'll start. Um, I'll start with my spirit of the games. So my spirit of the games is something that and I can't remember. I think it may have been 20... You'll know this. It was 2015 or 16 when it first showed. Maybe it was even earlier than that. But it's <clears throat> Zeus. Zeus oh. is my spirit of the games. The Zeus oh, yeah. Grid, because I think, I want to say it was 2015 that that first showed up. Yeah. Um, hmm. I think it, so I want to say a, a mini Zeus version may have showed up for 2014 for the Muscle Up mm-hmm. Biathlon event. But I, the Zeus rig, as we know it, I, I believe the one that you could drive a semi truck across. I remember <laughs> yes. us talking about that. Was either 2015 or 2016. Okay. And it was one of those things where when you first saw it, you know, it was, there have been a lot of impressive things that have been constructed at the games. Uh, And I think back to the, like the legless rope climb rig, which was really impressive when they put that up. Uh, The killer cage, you know, not Mm -hmm. to, you know, jump ahead and maybe give away anybody's picks. But when you saw Zeus, it was, you know, it kind of took your breath away. It was just the size and the scope of it. And the fact that they were able to construct it as quickly as they did. And the amount of things that you could, you know, they had it built for and you could do and, it was, I mean, it just now is one of those things that you expect to see when you go to whatever outdoor stadium you're going to at the CrossFit Games. So it used to be, you know, the soccer stadium in, in Carson, and now it's the uh, outdoor stadium in Madison, Wisconsin. And it just mm-hmm. doesn't seem right if you don't have that rig. And I can't remember the, the we had some crazy stats about it, about the amount of steel <laughs> that was used. And, you know, Tommy, you brought that up about being able to drive a semi across it. Yeah. I mean, Rogue doesn't. You know, they, when they go big, they go big. It's like no one else is ever going to match this. And, and I just, it's like, yeah, we're going to build a big rig that spans the field. Now, most people would think, okay, yeah, you're just going to, you know, standard gym rig is just going to stand the field. Oh, no, no. We're going to make this thing ginormous. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that thing was, that was impressive. I, I, I just love the fact that, like, Rogue doesn't, like, doesn't leave any stone unturned when it comes to that. And they pull out all the stops. I mean, I, I don't know if this isn't exactly a stat, but I'm pretty sure they used more steel on Rogue than like the entire Rockefeller di- dynasty and in the Industrial <laughs> Revolution. And, and that's, you know, probably not an over-exaggeration, but like I used to always, one of the things that I used to always love is I go talk to the Rogue guys at the start of the weekend. Usually we do a package about Rogue setup and Katie would always give us how many semis worth mm-hmm. of stuff they had to ship in. And that just always blew my mind. So that's my, that's my spirit of the games, the Zeus rig. I'm going to go now to my, my dark horse. Now this, you were going for the, from the gigantic to the somewhat small, but mm. extremely important in my mind. And that is, and I can't remember again what year this one first showed up, but this is the rogue competition barbell that was shorter. Oh, Because that really helped, I think, clean up the competition oh, floor. They, they, they put more people out there because they had you know, that, the, whatever amount of distance they took off the regular barbell to the competition barbell made a difference on the competition floor. It cleaned it up. It allowed you to put you know, maybe one or two more athletes out there. It allowed more room for the judge. And it was just one of those things that it's, it, it, when you saw it, you're like, oh, well, that makes total sense. Now we have so much more room out there, so much room for activities here. Yeah. Um, and, and it was like, such a simple and elegant solution yeah. to a bunch of barbells crowding the floor. And, and I think it was heavy 17.5 when they did that one where they had, I don't know how many barbells they had. The 100 there. barbells out. Yeah. It was 10 and lanes of 10. Wouldn't have been able to do that with the, comp- with the regular barbells. So the competition barbells made it possible. So that was one thing that I think, uh, as far as a, a visual standpoint, you know, isn't super impressive just looking at the piece of equipment. But what it did and what it allowed uh, Dave Castro and company to do at the games, I think, was pretty significant. So yeah. those, are my, those are my first two. Those are two really good. We, we've definitely taken a slightly different mm-hmm. approach here, and I really like that. Okay. Um, the, the short bar, I want to say the first time I remember the shorty bar showing up was maybe 2014. I think you're right. 
maybe 2013. Right. But I, I, I want to say they had it for um, Nasty Girls 2.0, which is a 2014 mm-hmm. uh, uh, regional workout. But yeah, like you said, like that, that heavy 17.5, and one of my favorite shots from that year was just the, it, there was like an overhead spider cam shot of mm-hmm. like unleash the hounds of the equipment crew <laughs> as they rolled all the barbells out for like the, the weight changeover. And I was like, that is amazing. Yeah. It looks, it looks like this massive barbell ripple. It was so cool. Um, all right. Yeah. All right. So my dark horse is the big Bob. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there, there's kind of a theme here for me in particular with the team programming. But the Big Bob was one of the first adaptations, in my opinion, of how the, the evolution of team programming really started to move forward, right? So we stopped, as Pat Sherwood used to say, it's, it was no longer, you know, a team of specialists and you, you break Mongo out of his cage for this heavy deadlift. <laughs> and, and now it's, it's, we all have to be well-rounded. We have to work together. We have to work in unison. And what are some ways that we can adapt implements like odd objects, sled pushes, things like that, what we see in the individual competition and re- like apply it in a way that's, that's reasonable, pretty exciting and pretty devastating. And the big Bob was one of the first iterations of that. And I remember it showed up, I think in 2013. I, I think they may have had it in 2012. Yeah. 2012 might've my, might, cause the reason why I'm kind of curious, because I know it showed up when, when Hacks Pack was on it, was in, involved. And I remember doing a big Bob test at the ranch in Aromas with the Diablo CrossFit crew. And you know what? I think it might have been 20, 2012, but I know in between 2012 and 2013, we saw it getting used at the ranch for that testing because that was the year that Alessandra Pacelli um, – went individual and i remember watching her work on big bob and like outperforming her teammates and then doing the test running up the hill and thinking like holy cow she's got individual potential but uh that that was and we saw bob the big bob evolve over time too from the the six person format to the four person format to the fantasy land adaption to where Mm -hmm. you got you pushed the sled and then you had to do an actual crossfit workout off the, the rig that was attached to Bob. So I thought that was a kind of a, a cool way to start to incorporate unity as a team. And you, you'll see later that I, I, I definitely touch on that more. Yeah. All so, right. So that's your dark horse. So my, my, my spirit of the games is I'm not going to lie. It's a little cheesy, um, but it showed up for the first and only time, I think, oh, maybe not only time, but it first showed up in 2017 in our first year in Madison, it's the cheese curd. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I so like it. Hence the cheesy joke. It was it was a subtle dad joke. <laughs> I get that's but, good. And so while while really all it was was a yellow version of a sandbag, to me this the symbolism of it was important to me. So this was the first year in a new home in Madison, Wisconsin, and there was a ton of doubts about how Madison would be as a host. CrossFit effectively leaving the first real home of the game since it became this kind of commercial success. And, you know, we're leaving the bright lights of the the StubHub Center and, you know, the games are going to be held outside of its home state of California for one time. And to me, this was a a little nod to a little homage to the region in a way that built it into a workout that really screamed Wisconsin. And it also just kind of let everyone know, like, we're invested in, in Madison as much as Madison is invested in us. And to me, that, that just meant, that meant a ton. Like, the fact that it's a simple thing, but the fact that Rogue would go out of their way, Dave would go out of the way to get yellow, you know, sandbag D-ball covers printed just, to, just for the, the show of calling it a cheese curd to pay homage, this – the the subtlety and the symbolism of that gesture wasn't lost on me and uh and i thought it was a great event especially to kick off sunday morning in madison like the start of the the start of like the final day of competition you had the madison madison triplet and you know the cheese curd hay bales really gritty just grunt work type blue collar um event and i i i thought that was super cool and it was just 
you know, I remember us going off there and everybody said, you got to try the cheese curds. You got to try the cheese curds. And then, you know, they, they pay homage with that little piece of equipment. Yeah, that's one thing that I will definitely give. And this goes back to Zeus as well. Uh, Rogan and, and Dave Castro as well. They, they understand it, how to blend showmanship with a good test. And yes. I think that was sort of just a little bit, you know, that was not necessary. You didn't need yellow. You didn't, you know, you could have called them, you, you know, you could have called them uh, cheese curds and hadn't been black. It would have been yep. just fine. Uh, but the fact that, like you said, they went that extra mile, that was, that was pretty cool. All right, so we have the cheese curd and Big Bob. Dark Horse, your big is Big Bob, cheese curd, spirit of the games. All right, so now we get into our podium, and we're going to have a repeat because my third place is the Big Bob. Uh, and for all the reasons that you said, because I, I think that it, it was the first implement that we saw that really forced you to work you know, as a team. There wasn't anything up to that point that had all six members, because this is before we went to four member teams, working together as one trying to accomplish the exact same goal. I mean, I think in 2012, we had, we had the, the uh, rack carry, remember the chains? Was that, I think that was 2012. But again, right. that, wasn't, that was one person working at a time. And yeah, Big Bob definitely changed that. And I'm yeah. just a fan of pushing things, you know, being, you know, football, we spent a lot of time pushing sleds and, and tackling dummies and all that kind of stuff. And I love the way it was constructed. And then you mentioned Fantasyland about how, okay, we're just going to make a pull-up bar off the back of this thing. And now you got to push it. You got to do, you know, pull-ups. Uh, and I thought that was, that was really cool. And I, I, I love the fact that it is a staple of team competition because you cannot hide your weak link on that thing. You can't do it. And then, you know, they pull it, they push it, they do all kinds of cool things with it. And uh, yeah, it is definitely made the team competition a lot more exciting to watch. I, you know, it's funny. I just recently watched that, that, uh, that, that rack carry that like basically a yoke carry from mm -hmm. the team games back in the day. Remember Dell? His I name do. is Dell from, yeah. from Ch Champlain Valley CrossFit. Mm -hmm. Just absolutely destroyed it. It was, oh man, that was so fun. That was such a fun, um, uh, like highlight just to watch. Yeah, they, uh, and, and, and I love this team just standing there going, yeah, yeah, this is happening. Just watch <laughs> this. Look at this guy. Yeah. You keep yeah. going. <laughs> Yeah, Champlain Valley CrossFit. There's a lot of fit people up in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was uh, – Danny Horan was out of there. Yep. Um, also, you know, one of Matt Fraser's first training training locations. So his home gym, if you will. But cool. So, Big uh, Bob, third place. All right. So, my third place one is – this one gave me the wow factor. So, okay, it's another team implement. And we've only really seen it once. And it also sh – it showed up in 2013 – and it was one of the few times in, as a, you know, you know, work in working for CrossFit and watching as a spec, as, from the spectator viewpoint that I was just like, wow, just floored and, uh, and impressed by the pure spectacle of it. And, and it's pretty simple. It was the Iditarod sled from 2013. So it was, okay. if, if you remember the burden run for individuals, it finished with a sled drag across the finish mm -hmm. line in, in the the soccer stadium well for the teams they couldn't do that they did a, their own version of the burden run but then they did a separate a separate um a separate race of the iditarod so that was involved um you know i think they did three versions of that same race and they had to drag a sled that was attached to multiple people off at once and i think it was it was kind of set up like dog sleds like actual dog mm -hmm. sledding and I remember for the final event, for the final round of it, there was the most weight on the sled. Sitting back, and I was standing, actually standing next to Tony Budding at the time. And they said, and they're just absolutely, everyone's wiped already just from like going balls out. And they say go again. And literally everyone comes clawing out on all fours, like running, and then hits tension on the sled. And they're just like animals on all mm -hmm. fours crawling across the uh the field and there were so many lanes and they all came out at once it was like this massive start and everyone just went oh like it was this pro raw primal type feel to it that you definitely could sense when you were in this in the soccer stadium um you know since the best way i can put it is you know in infinity war when they unleashed the ch <laughs> when they <laughs> when they unleashed the chitari on wakanda rest in peace and they're, they're basically all everyone inside of of the shield is basically watching as these chitari are just unleashed like person after person and they're just basically throwing themselves at the 
at the um, at the the shield yeah. and basically sacrificing themselves to get through, and they're still clawing over each other. And then they decide to open up the shield because it's just like they're never going to stop. And and then they when they unleash them through the shield again, you see that nice overhead like uh, painting shot of all of them running on all fours, and you get to see Cap and Black Panther out ahead of everybody. But yeah, that's what it reminded me of, and it was like, man these people will scratch tooth and nail just for an, a few extra points here. And that, like, that's what that event was really about. Yeah. There were some great shots. I remember from that, from that event, like you said, of people just, you know, pulling turf out of the ground. Cause they were mm -hmm. trying to, trying to, trying to dig. So uh, yeah, I did rush that. I forgot about that one. That's yeah. a good one. So moving on now to number two, and we're going to stay in the teams and, and I'm going to go back to, so there's, there's kind of been, there are three versions I think of this. Okay. And the first showed up in 2013 and it's the worm mm -hmm. and it's not the one that we know now with the nice canvas covering over it. It is the one that they first came up with that was all wood with no cover on it with gaps in between the segments of just rope and the thing looked just raw and awful. And I remember People like someone got a thumb, I think, caught between the sections and it was, you know, oh, yeah. profusely. We had, you know, chafed ears. I mean, that thing beat the you know what out of people and in more ways than just making them tired from having to move it. And this was another thing where the team competition took a big step because, mm -hmm. as you know, like that's having you've used the, the new version of it. I've tried to, like, I've never worked out with it, but I've had to move it before. And I know we had to move it in the studio. Oh, yeah. it's brutal. And like, it's not like, it's not easy to, to manage, you know, it's amazing. Like how easy some of the best teams make that look. And of course they practice on it and all that stuff. But at that time, I, that was the first time any teams had done that. And it, you could really tell like who was, who was used to working together as a unit, like what teams, had a plan for who was going to call the shots, even when things started going wrong, you know, who the leaders were, you know, what teams were able to figure out, okay, I need to step back and just listen to this person and make sure that we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. And I just like the fact that again, like the big Bob, you couldn't hide your weakest link. Yeah. And uh, man, that thing wreaked some serious havoc. And, and it was, it was so awful that again, you know, the next year they decided to put a canvas cover over it and change it up a little bit, but yeah, it was yeah. just, it was such a just simple, you know, old school, just awful thing. And it was, it was your grandpa's worm. Yes. You know, it's not, it's like the living embodiment of your grandpa's tail. Right. Like back in my day, we had to walk uphill both ways in the snow barefoot. And you know what? You know what I got for Christmas in my eighth, my, when I was eight, I got a job. <laughs> like that like, like that that's what version of the worm that first one was this new one is all you know the mm -hmm. the kids I, getting iphones at six type worm mm -hmm. i feel like i feel like that worm from 2013 is the worm that if you took today's worm to like your dad and say hey i want this and your dad would say well, i can make that <laughs> you would get the 2013 yeah. oh, worm God. right that's yeah. That's basically what you would get. So. And, you, and you'd come back from playing with it with your friends outside, and Jimmy's got an ear ripped off, and Bobby's <laughs> popped his thumb like a grape in between the blocks, mm -hmm. and <laughs> someone, some kid comes looking like Hellraiser with all yep. the splinter, splinters in his head. <laughs> just, you know, yeah, just like the old, the old playgrounds used to play with a wrought iron and oh. giant wood chips in there, just, oh, you know, not safe at all. Broken glass, all kinds of stuff. So, that, wow. so number two for me is the 2013 worm. My, my my elementary school playground was literally literally called Woody. It yeah. was just it was the big wooden structure. We just called yeah. it Woody. We had the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that's <laughs> splinters of plenty. <laughs> oh man, the amount of Jimmy Snooker elbows from the top <laughs> the top of that thing that I planted on a few yeah. unsuspecting people. Oh, yep. That's great. All right, so uh, my second place one is. Also an original version of, a, of an implement, mm -hmm. but for the individual side, and it also showed up for the first time in 2013, and that is the original pig. Yes, so, love the pig. Yeah, so it showed, made my list. it showed up in 2013 at the Burden Run, and I remember, I remember for the longest time, everyone was like, how can we make tire flips more applicable to competition in a way that sta you can standardize and make it look good and make it look formidable. And, you know, 2013 shows up. We've already had the 
the marathon row and the, the sprint row to start and the pool. And then we have the burden run for, I mean, depending on who you talk to, it's either the greatest or the worst event <laughs> in CrossFit Games history. You know, a lot of people from on the other side of the fence loved it. Our media team, particularly Mike Roth, <laughs> hated it. Um, but <laughs> just because of how difficult it was to cover mm-hmm. and some stuff that went on behind the scenes, obviously. But I remember watching so many people get stuck dead in their tracks for that first variation of the pig. And it just looked like this just month. It was like this neon green monstrosity that everyone was just like getting wrecked by. And I remember Jason Khalifa, who was on fire to start that competition. Mm-hmm. I think he won three straight events. And the third event was that burden run. He came out and manhandled that thing. Yeah. And you know, flipped it all the way on his way to an early lead in the CrossFit Games. And that was also the beginning of, similar to the worm, how just because we found an implement doesn't mean we can't make it better. Right. And then they eventually refined the worm to being cased. And it's, you know, a little bit more even loading throughout. And, you know, we saw it show up in the soccer chipper in 2015. It was also one of the causes of Matt Fraser's demise in 2015 mm-hmm. when he didn't know how to flip it. And I, I, I loved that event, you know, media coverage and yeah. difficulty notwithstanding. And I, I thought that was a huge step forward for individuals as well as, as tar- in terms of like building completely new implements that we've never seen. Yeah, I loved the bird run. One of my, you know, and I was on that media side. Of it. I thought that was such a great event. I mean, visually, like with the, with the long shot on the, on the soccer, or the, I'm sorry, not the soccer field, but it was the track, mm-hmm. the infield in of the track. Yep. Where you had the pigs flipping. And just using the whole facility. Like, I loved it. And for those of you, uh, you know, Tommy mentioned Mike Roth. For those of you who are wondering uh, why he hated it so much, is it because it was just impossible to cover? All, you know, it was the first time we've used the whole facility there. And it is now, he now lovingly refers to it as the double fister. <laughs> because <laughs> the only way you got over it was to, to drink heavily afterwards. I think there are t-shirts that exist that oh, yeah. I survived the double fister on it that some of the crew will wear uh, every now and then at the CrossFit Games. So, yeah, man. <laughs> The pig is, I love the pig. I actually got to play with it a couple of times too. The old green. Oh, yeah. 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 And to showcase how far he's come back in the day, Dave Castro didn't play nice with the media team back then. No. And he started that event early, much to the chagrin of the the media team, which is partially why. Um, And Dave was just kind of running on his own time frame. And we're like, wait, what? Yeah. How are we going to cover this event if we don't know when it's starting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Craziness. Um, But, uh, oh, man, I just had something. I, I I had a, I had a, a comment that you, that one of yeah oh well it'll come back to me okay but yeah it, it was uh you said something and I had a really funny aside that it reminded me of about that the... no nah, it was about that event in particular oh yes uh, but so every time I think about the burden run because it it covered you know you know that that famous SNL skit with you know blue oyster cult and christopher yes. walken yeah he's like space. explore the space <laughs> that's what that's what the burden run represents yeah. to me like we really explored the space we did. Of, of the stuff up center that time yeah one of my favorite shots too i remember we had this it was and i give mike roth credit for this is when jason Kalipa emerged from the tunnel he's the only guy in the stadium he gets on the sled and we had this great sort of 360 spider cam shot of him mm-hmm. uh pulling that thing and it was awesome to see the crowd oh, yeah. crazy for me yeah i was a, that was a I, it's, it's one event that i would just love to do because it just looks fun mm-hmm. you know? but no i wouldn't want to carry that log because that's another <laughs> thing i think that ripped people's ears up yeah um, it was like like the baby worm i guess you would call it for individuals all right so number one for me and this is a lot of it just has to do with the pure aesthetics of the way that this thing looked and i believe this was 2014 and it was the sprint sled oh yeah because you, they could have very easily just rolled a, your standard, you know, sled that you see in your gym out there and done essentially the same test. But they wanted something different. And Rogue builds this thing that looks sleek. It kind of looks like a, you know, a sci-fi, you know, bobsled if you were going to hop in the thing. Yeah. And it, the, and I remember they explained to him, like, why they built it that way is because they wanted it to kind of wedge into the ground offer more resistance than a normal sled would be you know, more surface area up front because i think it was at a point at the at the front and it was just you know we had we had one in the in the studio uh way back and i can remember moving it around and just thinking man this thing is it, it's just 
diabolical because it yeah. looks easy. And I think a lot of the athletes thought it was going to be easy. And they uh, quickly found out that it was not. I think it was Neil Maddox who figured out that you have to actually kind of pick it up and push it. Yeah. The, just the fact that this goes back to kind of your, your point that you made with the cheese curd. You didn't need to do this to make that event cool. But the fact that you did made it a great test and made it visually spectacular because the way that those sleds look, it just looked neat. Yep. It didn't look boring. And uh, yeah, I, I, for whatever reason, I mean, there, there were certainly more impressive things that, that have been made and uh, it was a short event, but I just loved that sled. And again, I'm just a fan of pushing things. So mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was uh, that was well done on everyone's part. Just to and, and again to think to let's not do a standard sled. Let's make something that's going to be even worse. And then they put their heads together and they come up with this. And it just it's yeah, it's it's really cool. Yeah, totally. I I remember playing with that one in the studio that we had for mm -hmm. so long. I, all my legends of Legend of Zelda fans will <laughs> will know this, but I used to I used to call them the bomb chew sleds because in Legend of Zelda <laughs> you had these little these these bombs called bomb chews. It was basically like a bomb that looked like a little mouse, but mm -hmm. that had almost like Wolverine style like ears. Okay. And you set them down and then they just followed along the ground, like plowed along the ground until they blew up. And that, that the slug kind of reminded me of that, like that shape and style. And I figured that's, it's also the similar mechanism. You just put it on the ground, you push it until you hit something and blow up. Now that was, what version of the game was that in? Ooh, I, it was definitely an Ocarina of Time. Was it? Okay, because yes. that was the only one I played. And I remember spending hours on the Water Temple. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh man. That uh, level was heinous. That, that <laughs> I mean, that, that was also one of the times I knew my brother was going to be a fantastic gamer is he just blew through that, yeah. that, that video game. But, yeah, that, that, is, that is one of the greatest video games of all time. In it my was. Opinion. It was a lot of fun. The open world concept was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, man, we're really exploring the space here. We are exploring. We're burden running here. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. So my top pick. Um, so you've already said it, mm. and it's the worm. Um, and I, I, it's funny. The worm gets a lot of hate for people, you know, because they're like, oh, I'm, it's, it's, I get tired of it, or it's like it's always a part of this, and. The worm is my number one for a couple of reasons. There's no better there's no better team test on the planet f within the realm of CrossFit than there is the worm. Not, there's not a single implement that simultaneously tests work capacity at a high level in a, in in a very variety of ways, while also forcing you to work on and potentially expose the elements of teamwork like communication. Um, and uh, basically troubleshooting and problem solving on the fly, you know, in the event that someone messes up and you could, you'd be hard pressed to find a single new implement that's been introduced to the games that it has had a bigger influence on the CrossFit games competition than, you know, than the worm. Once the worm was implemented, the team competition forever changed and it has become a cornerstone of team programming um, so much so from the innovation standpoint, from Rogue creating new variations of it, whether it's there was the six-person worm, the four-person worm, the the slug, right, which mm -hmm. was yep. uh, or which was like a two, three-person worm, but heavy. And you can see the ripple effects of it. I, I would say culturally, I guess, and how it's shown up at all levels. Now you go to you go to local competitions, and the worm is involved because it is such an integral part of the team test now. And that's just one of those things that, you know, uh, it's funny, someone commented on a post of mine, you know, the subject, the subject is irrelevant, but basically to the effect of like, um, you know, why would you use something for it's an un like what for a use that wasn't its original intended use. And it's like, the worm was created for Navy SEAL training and all that stuff that Dave used to do in his prior job. And it wasn't necessarily intended for this, like testing the fittest teams type class. Now there's some obvious, obviously some carryover from, as far as the teamwork aspect, but the, whoever created the worm didn't think one day the fittest athletes on earth are going to use this to test their team. No, but it, if it basically found this new home and has become such a big part of it, and, and that's all a part of the evolution process of the programming of the CrossFit Games. And 
I have used the worm and it is an absolutely awful implement and there is nowhere to hide from it. And I never recommend being Marston and Heber's teammates in a three person <laughs> worm because they will hang you out to dry 100% just like they did for me. Yeah, so that was an unfortunate situation in which they put you on, on, that, on that worm. But yeah, I agree 100% with you. It's like, I know people sometimes say, oh, here comes the worm again. Well, it's, it works. It's, there's, you, know, you try to think of something that would be better and you, I don't, you can't. And, and, pay, and pay attention too. Like when you see the worm in competition, watch the teams that are really good at it and the teams that aren't. And there is a striking difference between those types of teams, both in the, and it's, and it comes back to the idea of virtuosity, right? When mm -hmm. you, when you watch, when you watch Rich Froning or Matt Fraser, you know, move and do thrusters, it looks a lot different than watching myself or, you know, Heber Cannon do thrusters. <laughs> And there's a, and, and that's one of those things where the visual element pairs up to the fitness element, right? Because the it's done so virtuously, and and, and that that carries over with the worm too. Watching Mayhem use the worm is a thing of beauty. Oh yeah, you're like I. They may not be winning the event right now, but they're doing that in the expression, the true expression of that movement. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, there's only there's you know you can find them in a lot of different movements, but for the team competition, it's most readily apparent with the worm. Yeah. Uh, some that may, that almost made my list. You mentioned one, the pig. I, I mm -hmm. love that implement. Uh, killer cage from 2011 almost yeah. went that, because that was the first time I think that, cause it was only the third year, right. That they, they were at the home Depot center where they built something out of the ordinary in the tennis stadium. So that, yeah. that, that event was really cool. Uh, the rescue sled that the teens use for the for, oh. the, yeah, for the swim, I think was really yeah. cool. But that put a different spin on the swimming thing. Cause that really forced you to stay together. You, know, you couldn't send mm -hmm. your horses out first. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the paddle boards, the, the long paddle boards that they've yeah. used multiple, multiple times. I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, those, there, there've been so many just like you know, good things in there, but, but uh, yeah, those, those are the ones that almost made it for me. Yeah. So the, the couple ones that almost made it, the snail, which, Oh Yeah. We, mm -hmm. and, the, and and they called the they called the new version of the snail that you pulled the slug too right mm -hmm. i believe so yes so the, the push or pull version of the snail the uh let's see uh the banger so yeah. um mm -hmm. i thought that was i thought that's a great concept but it hasn't i don't feel like it has been properly applied at, you mm -hmm. know in crossfit competition yet so and you can't really use that regularly right um, a couple other ones. Let's see. Oh, the wheelbarrow. <laughs> oh which, yeah, <laughs> which we've seen twice for the same mm -hmm. the sandbag twenty fifteen workout. And whatever you do, make sure Pat Sherwood is not assembling the wheelbarrow <laughs> in the back. Otherwise, you might get Matt Chand and have your have it fall apart mid competition. Oh man. Um, a last one that I thought I just really enjoyed it. It doesn't really have much relevance to competition. We've since found better variations of it. But back in 2011, they used these like military gas cans for the farmer's yeah, walk. That. Yeah, those are cool. Yeah, and and since you know, it, like for strongman's fear, they use the typical uh, strongman's like farmer's walk um, rig. But I, I just thought that was a super cool, yeah. like quick, easy way, and and it looked different. And in 2011, it was a, it was a neat little uh, twist to the uh, the skill sessions that they did um, for that competition that we haven't seen show up since. Yeah, I would even throw uh, the obstacle course in there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I thought mean, about it's not, it's not something we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've seen that, but it was cool that they actually, you know, they they built it and they've used yeah. it multiple times, and it was that was a lot of that was a fun event. That was one of those events where I was like, I wonder how this is going to play out. But the way that they they did it with the bracket or the uh, elimination style, I thought was was fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's funny because like that was a you know we finally got to see the car, a cargo net in competition, and I felt like you know before before the uh, reverse hyper was the, like the cool piece of equipment to have that never yeah. got used in your gym. <laughs> I feel like the gyms that had a cargo net were like similar. You're like, Oh, you guys got a cargo net. And they're like, yeah, it collects dust. And you know, mm -hmm. and I was always curious to see how you would get involved in competition. And, you know, we saw it almost kill Matt Fraser and Pat Bellner back <laughs> yeah. to back. Anytime I'm having a bad day, I just go back and watch that video. Right. Just because yeah. I'm like, you know what? Serendipity exists in the world because they both should have been hurt at that workout oh, yeah. and they both made it through and made the podium. So my situation can improve too. Yeah. You know, another thing that I would even throw in there, again, just the, the plates themselves, the, the, uh, yeah. the barbell plates and the way that, 
that those look on the floor with a logo and it's just stuff you don't need to do, but little details that help take that competition and that spectacle to the next level. That's a, those are always fun to check out. Yeah, totally. Um, oh man, I'm trying to think if there's anything we forgot. Yeah, same here. Hmm. Killer cage was good. Yeah. I mean, you could even say the Zeus rope. Yeah. Which is the heavy yeah. rope. I mean, it's yeah. just a heavy jump rope. Right. And the thicker climbing rope, stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, um, I think we have, I think those are two good lists that we compiled there. Really looking forward, I'm really looking forward to seeing, you know, what, what other people think. Um, because there's, I'm sure there's something out there that we missed. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that was, that was a fun one. Brought it back a lot of good memories of events that, uh, that were good tests, but also just visually a lot of fun to check out. And, and again, I'll give Dave and, and the whole crew and Rogue credit, man. They know how to thread that needle of good tests with something really cool to look at as well. But it doesn't, it's not like the something that we built makes this a gimmick. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's been, a, that's been a, a lot of fun to watch over the years. And, and hopefully we get some more of that uh, here in 2020, whatever the games look like. So yeah. well, that, <laughs> that is going to do it for this edition of Podium Picks. Thanks so much uh, for checking it out. And be sure to check out Working Against Gravity, workingagainstgravity.com. Elite 50 is the code you can use to get $50 off. Uh, your first month of nutrition coaching. We also want to thank Whoop for being a sponsor of the show. Go to whoop.com and use the code TALKING15. That is it. Thanks so much for Tommy Marquez. I'm Sean Woodland, and we will talk to you guys next time.